Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining our webinar today, Understanding LED. All the PG seminars and webinars are in part sponsored by Energy Trust of Oregon. We work together to make sure the concepts and recommendations that you learn in our classes are consistent across all of our individual programs and services. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to learn about LED and how that knowledge will help you make lighting upgrade decisions. This webinar was designed with PGE end use customers in mind, particularly those that qualify for Energy Trust of Oregon cash incentives. However, this LED webinar might also be beneficial for all listeners today. LED, or light emitting diode technology, has created a revolution in lighting because it offers many advantages that other light sources can't provide nearly as well. Here's our agenda today, and throughout the presentation, I will be focusing on things like saving energy, saving money, which you might be interested in, of course, and providing better quality lighting through a lighting upgrade project. Our goal today is to supply you with information about LED lighting and energy efficiency that will make a difference at your place of business. So we do invite your active participation today. One way is by using the annotation tools that Beth just talked about. I'll ask you to use these tools right now. We plan to leave some time at the end to answer your questions. So if you could just circle or highlight or check a box or have some fun on some of these key learning objectives that we'll cover today, which one is most important to you? I'll give you a minute to color. So we won't go into, depth, into complete depth today on how LEDs work, but we'll just cover some of the basics. Uh, we'll address familiar current lighting technologies, you know, fluorescent, things like that, and what the LED alternatives are. The focus will be on retrofit. However, if you're building a new construction facility, that might also apply too. You'll get some education, definitely. And at the end, we'll get you some help with uh, lighting upgrade projects and some incentive information. Thank you for that awesome feedback. <laughs> Looks like we're gonna cover almost everything that you're looking for today. So let's get going. This first graph illustrates the breakdown of various lighting technologies uh, based on energy consumption. As you can see, the residential lighting, for example, is dominated by incandescent lamps. So if you look at the, the colors here, uh, LED is yellow. And this is the, the, this is the area where the yellow um, portion is, right down here. And incandescent is kind of what uh, lamps are for residential is very dominated. The commercial sector uses mostly fluorescent T8s, linear fluorescent. And the industrial and outdoor use a lot of HID, as you'll see on the graph. LED is barely showing up, and this was in 2010, so it's probably about less than 1%. But let's remember that was 2010, so what has happened in the last five years? Well, this graph is illustrating the dramatic growth that is expected from LED by year end. And I think a lot of you might have already seen that, maybe even in your facilities. They uh, refer to this as uh, CAGR, compound annual growth rate. And notice that most of the growth is coming from the replacement of existing incumbent technologies. So anything like, you know, mostly fluorescent and incandescent that you have in your facilities, they expect uh, that those to be replaced with LED. So this is significant, as you can see. This uh, slide here represents some information from the Department of Energy, and it illustrates potential for energy savings for nine uh, common lighting applications. So your current savings mostly is from replacement lamps such as a PAR38, MR16, and some of your A lamps. As you can see down here, uh, these are the colors. So if, take a look over here, and there's 34% are from your directional like PAR lamp, 31% over here uh, from A lamps, things like that. So the future is this chart over here. So it's telling us that as this LED technology continues to embrace and, and uh, 
explode in our market, we're going to see about 30% of this savings over time coming from things like troughers, that kind of a light fixture, like you might see in your um, facilities, you know, parabolic or lens troughers. So again, big significant uh, growth here in LED over time. So before we dive into how all of this works and some of the ideas for you, I want to show you some other things that LED has done to different markets. So here's an example. Uh, if you were going to do some Googling for fun stuff on LED, uh, here's an LED glove light. They call this the torch glove or something like that. And you could have your own little built-in flashlight on your hand. That's exciting. Here's another area where you might see LEDs. Uh, this is a little bit scary right here, but hey, it's an option. This is one of my favorite because think about how much money you'll save on a, a diamond ring if you can use LED instead, assuming the cost of LED has come down. So lots of options for LED. If uh, you were sitting here in the studio today, I would show you my LED lip gloss. I actually have some lip gloss that lights up uh, when I put it on so I can actually see what I'm doing. So. If you take a look at all these options right here, can you imagine fluorescent doing something like that? LED has really given us a lot of opportunity and options in, in our world, not just in the lighting world, but as you can see, some other crazy stuff. So what is an LED? LEDs are a form of solid state lighting. They are semiconductor devices that generate light. LEDs turn electricity into light. Light is produced through the movement of electrons through a semiconductor material. Many components needed, um, there are many components needed for a LED light, for an LED light source, including some type of a driver, which you would normally think of as a ballast, uh, for proper electrical operation. LED lighting is different from our current light sources, uh, similar to like a fast-paced high-tech industry. Uh, think about your cell phones. That's kind of what's happened to the lighting market. It's just as going faster than we can keep up with. But this fast pace clashes with current slower-paced um, products in our lighting industry, such as fluorescent, which has been around for a long time and it, de it definitely has improved, but it's been a slower process for sure. So because of this, a lot of culture uh, adjustments are being made. Companies are changing the way that they do business. When I first started in the lighting retrofit uh, market, I've been in lighting for a long time, but lighting retrofit was maybe eight or nine years ago. And uh, you know, the company that I was working with, the manufacturer, they basically were saying, hey, stay away from LED for now until we get our research done. And as soon as they got that research done, bam, that's all they make now. So, well, almost all they make, I should say. Uh, so it has come it, quite, it has moved quite fast. You'll also see a lot of new companies entering the lighting world that you hadn't seen before. One example is Cree Lighting. They just used to make LED chips and then they moved into light fixtures as well and lamps and things like that. So, um, and you'll see just other electronic device type of companies coming into the lighting market because it's different than it used to be. One of the main reasons that people would use LED or that are using them now is because they produce light very efficiently. So, for example, uh, they have uh, a very long, one of the reasons is they have a very long life compared to incumbent technology. Some of them claim up to 100,000 hours or more. And another strength that they have is they are very um, directional in nature. So for some applications, this is good. Uh, something like where you're highlighting product where incandescent really was the only source that was working for that. Now LED can highlight product really well where compact fluorescent didn't. LEDs are also small, so the fixtures they live in uh, or that they are built in can be very compact, which is great because think about how big we have had to make light fixtures in order to include fluorescent lamps and ballasts and things like that. So now the source is so much smaller, we can still push a lot of light out of those fixtures, but uh, they can be very compact, which is, is cool, especially helpful because um, they require a heat sink and so it enables a lot of flexibility in fixtures to, um, to keep it going. 
<clears throat> They're also very dimmable where fluorescent and other HID technologies had a harder time with dimming. So it's very strong in LED. They, they love dimming, they love to turn off and on, and that's not a problem for this electronic device. They have no mercury, uh, unlike fluorescent, and no UV that can be harmful to people and products. So what are some of the things that are a little more difficult still in the market? One of the big major areas is just education. Now you guys get bonus points today because you're getting some education on LED, and all of us, including those of us in the lighting market have to continually stay educated on this because it has you know, transformed our market quite a bit. It's just different than other technologies. So this is an area that I would say uh, continue to learn, um, spend some time testing, you know, that sort of thing. Um, obviously, cost has been a challenge for LED in the last few years, but I think you will see some significant changes in that. Uh, you might even hear some from me today, so you'll see that cost has come down. So how to get this product specified for your project is what hopefully you can glean from some of the information today, because even lighting designers are still learning um, new things about LED every day as well. So thinking of education, the Department of Energy, um, they have taken the lead over probably the last, uh, we might be up to 10 years now, maybe a little less, in promoting energy efficient solid state lighting. They actually have a full department called solid state lighting and you can see the website there down at the bottom of the page. This would be an area for you to go take a look at. Research and development activities are identifying ways to make LED more efficient and less expensive to make. So they also promote making as many components as possible right here in the U.S. So that's kind of cool. Demonstration projects are very helpful uh, for, for finding out how LED performs in the real world. End use uh, customers want confidence, you know, like yourself, when choosing some of these LED products. Uh, even myself, you know, when I go into a retail store looking at LED or any type of lighting for that matter, you kind of got to know something and uh, it's even with LED, it's been a little bit more complicated. I've had to learn some new techniques in looking at products and uh, just a few months ago, my mom called me and she was at the store at Lowe's or Home Depot and said, can you help me? <laughs> and I'm sure some of you have experienced that same thing. So the more education we get, the better. Hey, Don. Yes. On the screen under the testing and quality reporting section for under market development support, it mentions uh, the term caliper. What is caliper? Oh, yes, great, great question. Thanks for bringing that up, Beth. Um, basically, a caliper test that the Department of Energy is, um, help, does some work on, you can look on their website under their caliper testing and take a look at all kinds of different products. And what they'll do basically is they'll purchase a product uh, and then they will verify that it, it meets all the things that they're, the manufacturer is saying uh, that it does. So they'll test you know, light output, wattage and all that. And you can actually look at the report to see here's what they claim and here's what we found. So that's a great test and a good resource. Good question, thank you. In addition to all of that, um, another thing that the Department of Ener Energy works on are some, uh, is called a lighting tax label. And what you're looking at right here is a sample of voluntary LED lighting tax label, which is similar to kind of like a nutrition label. The Department of Energy has a website here, lightingfacts.com. You'll see at the bottom of the page if you want to look that up. And it has over 32,000 products listed right now. And basically what a manufacturer will do is send their product in and it will get, you know, um, they will do some testing and, and comparing and then they will list everything about that product here. I, I apologize, not testing, but they basically will list all of the items on that product, uh, about that product and put a label on it. So assuming that it meets all the requirements, it will get a label, which is pretty cool. You won't see this as much on like a retail product as you will like a spec sheet. Sometimes they'll have a lighting facts label on their specification sheet. So it lists things like light output, you know, and lumen output right there, and then how many watts, and then 
the lumens per watt, and this color chart is very helpful because sometimes, you know, if, you, if we tell you a Kelvin temperature, not everybody's going to understand that. So you can look and see, are we talking a really cool color or a warm color? So this has been very helpful. This down here tells you about the testing, the third-party testing that has been done on the product. So another label looks a little bit similar, also called Lighting Facts, is a label by the um, Federal uh, Trade Commission. So this is an FTC label, and it'll tell you things like it's Energy Star qualified, for example, and what kind of you know light appearance. It doesn't have the actual color, the black and white label. So it'll show you you know how warm it is to how cool it is. So you will see this on a lot of um, residential or retail type of product. This kind of. Label. Don, well, there are two different labels. What's the difference, and when would you expect to see one versus the other? The, the major difference here between these two labels that you just looked at would be one would be more for specifications on lighting fixtures, so this, this label would. And again, this is a voluntary thing, so manufacturers are not required to go through this program and get labeled. This uh, Federal Trade Commission FTC label is required. And it is for all of the retail, anything retail or you know residential type of product that's going on the shelf. It is required that they put this on it. So good question. So both of those will be helpful as you're trying to research products. You just have to kind of learn how to read the label, and this slide will give you that information. Another thing that a lot of companies around the country are, are looking at is what we refer to as a qualified products list. Uh, this is an LED qualified products list. And you're probably familiar with it if you've done any work with Energy Trust of Oregon over the years because we have been using the LED uh, qualified products list in addition to uh, qu products lists for uh, T8 lamps, for example. That was the CEE Consortium of Energy Efficiency list. So when we have a list, it's because they basically have set uh, some standards for energy efficiency and all these manufacturers go to this list and if they meet these standards, they get listed, and that way utilities can tell, okay, you got some good stuff there. So that's why Energy Trust uses this type of listing. Uh, Energy Star is one of the main lists. They have a lamp list uh, for PAR lamps and things like that, uh, incand any um, incandescent LED equals. They also have compact fluorescent equals. They also have a fixture list, which would cover things like uh, recessed down lights and some other undercounter lights. Design Lights Consortium is the main qualification list uh, for, and you can you know Google this, just uh, Google Design Lights Consortium if you want to take a look, or you can go here to the Lighting Design Lab to access all three of them. But the Design Lights Consortium is for fixtures and also LED uh, T8 tube lights. So you can find they have over 131,000 products, so you definitely have tons to choose from. It's a good thing, though, because it just kind of helps you, just like when you buy a really energy efficient washing machine, at least and it says Energy Star, you know it's good. So that helps. So before we go any further into LED, I want to go over some lighting terms that help us describe lamps, because we'll start with lamps today. Uh, unfortunately for some of us, this involves a little math. So <laughs> if you read the letters and the numbers here, this is a, an A19 lamp, so the A is, uh, indicates the shape of the lamp, so this one is a T8 lamp, so T indicates tube. This PAR is for a parabolic type of lamp, and MR is mirror reflector, so they all have a term. So the 19 part of the, this is the um, size, and it's measured in 19 eighths of an inch. So for example, for your tube, you have T for tubular, Eight for eight eighths of an inch, and um, then the rest, anything after that, the 35, that's color temperature and stuff like that. So this just gives you an idea of how, when you when you look at a lamp, how what what that catalog number indicates and the designation for it. Don, yes. Uh, what what does the A indicate in terms of shape? That is an arbitrary, so when they first started with A, that's what they came up with. <laughs> Great question. And then R would be for reflector, G for globe. Isn't that fun? So as 
as we dive into uh, uh, LED replacement lamps, take a look at this difference here. So this is your standard PAR 38 lamp, incandescent or compact fluorescent, that's the shape that you would look at. But if you look at this new LED version, very much the shape, but you see the heat sink on the outside, lots of electronic stuff inside. It's not a parabolic sort of um, reflector inside anymore, but they're still using the PAR in the term because that's what it's replacing. So that just gives you a little bit of an example. So on the left-hand side of the screen here, you see some energy-saving A lamps uh, from several different manufacturers, and uh, GE and Sylvania and Philips are kind of the main manufacturers for energy saving and condescent versions. Over the years, we moved on to, even though you can still buy some energy efficient incandescent, uh, lower wattage typically, uh, we've moved on to compact fluorescent over the years. And as some of you might have understood, they're, they're a little bit more difficult. Uh, color was difficult, dimming was difficult, uh, didn't always last as long as we thought. And I'm certainly not bad mouthing compact fluorescent replacement lamps, but because LED has come along, we, we have had a lot of opportunity for growth in the market because you can go from incandescent to LED save a little bit more energy than CFL and have great color and dim. So there are a lot of option, opportunities out there for you. So this is just the three big major manufacturers. Several different manufacturers make these as well. Don, what about the current cost of LEDs? Has that come down in recent years? Well, that's a great question. For comparison, you know, several years ago you would have been a few years ago, you would have had to purchase one of these lamps for, you know, 25 bucks. But they were probably up to 50 when they first started out, you know, probably five years ago. So a few months ago, I was at a retail location and found a two-pack, you know, similar to something like this, for less than five bucks. So I think we have come a long way on the cost of uh, LED technology, especially in this application. So that's just an example. Don't quote those prices, you know. <laughs> So let's look at some downlights to help illustrate the difference between these two words, efficacy and efficiency, and how that affects the amount of light that's delivered into your space. So efficacy is a term that indicates the lumens per watt of a light source. Efficiency is describing how much of the available light actually gets out of a light fixture. So in this example, we have a compact fluorescent lamp here with an efficacy of 60 lumens per watt. However, the number of lumens delivered to the space for a fixture like this is decreased when you install, uh, when you install a light source in some sort of a fixture. So what you're looking at here is a, this is the housing of the fixture and the, the lamp goes inside, right? And therefore, um, when you take that fixture efficiency because it sucks out some of the, the available light of that lamp, you end up with 35 lumens per, per watt to what we refer to as delivered lumens. Now, this is important because that is how you're going to start seeing LED in the market uh, discussed. So where before we might say that fixture with the compact fluorescent lamp is 58% fixture efficiency, but now when we're talking about LED here, it says, it says that it's 70 lumens per watt, that's the efficacy. It's 100% um, fixture efficiency, so you're getting the full 70 lumens per watt. That's how they are measuring it. All of the available light is getting out of that fixture. So that's a difference that's important for us to know, especially designers as they're designing a space, but even in the retrofit market, when you're replacing an existing, you may have to start looking at what you need in your space a little bit differently than you, than you have in the past. So if the existing downlight here had used an incandescent lamp, the savings would be much higher. By any measure, LED makes an excellent choice for this type of application. This downlight illustration demonstrates one of the many reasons why LEDs are so good at getting light to go where you want it to go. So in this case, this is a recessed down light up in your ceiling, and it's, it's distributing the, all of that light out. So it's a good application for it. 
there haven't been a lot of acceptable alternatives for a halogen reflector lamp in the past until LED came along. CFLs, or compact fluorescent lamps, didn't work well in this application, as some of you might have known. Uh, if you have some track lighting in your space, such as retail, or highlighting you know, pictures on a wall or something like that, had a very poor beam pattern and not enough, uh, it didn't have very good color quality. But this screw-in LED replacement lamp has come a long way over the last few years and is used widely. You'll see it like in furniture stores and things like that, highlighting you know, products. Uh, saves a ton of energy. The, the life of the lamp is you know, up to 50,000 hours, sometimes more, compared to your incandescent that was you know, less than 10,000 hours. Saves a ton on maintenance. And there's a variety of sizes and shapes available. So not only will you save energy, the, there are cash incentives available from Energy Trust of Oregon, and they are anywhere from you know, 15 to $20, I think, that you can get from Energy Trust right now. So that's a good application to take a look at. Just to be sure, um, you, you, another thing to, to remember, if you have a brand new track head that you are replacing and not using you know, a screw-in replacement lamp, there are also some incentives available for a brand new track head LED source. Uh, that are custom, they're not the prescriptive set incentive. So that's just something to remember. We'll get into that a little bit more later, uh, a little bit more at the end of the webinar, how you can look at cash incentives from Energy Trust. <clears throat> Always make sure, in addition, that your products are on a qualified products list uh, that we spoke of earlier, the Design Lights Consortium or Energy Star. Take a look at that for cash incentives. So one thing to keep in mind uh, is there are also some smaller version of LED lamps available now, and it's taken a few years to get these going. There's, I think they still need some work on some of them. But you, I've started seeing projects come through for this type of source as well, a little bit more decorative in nature. But think about um, your large PAR 38 and PAR 30 lamps that we looked at on the last slide. They have an easier time dissipating the heat that comes out the back of the lamp because it's large. So it becomes much more difficult to manage the heat um, with smaller lamps like this. So your MR16 type of lamp or you know, any of these smaller PAR lamps or this candelabra type of style lamp is a little bit more difficult. You can find LED MR16 replacement lamps uh, that are very you know, uh, good replacements and they're installed in the market already. You do need to make sure that you know your existing lamps are line voltage or low voltage. And there are several um, socket types we'll look at on the next slide uh, to make sure that you're putting it in, <laughs> in the right socket. Some companies have a tendency to cheat a little by making their MR16 lamp slightly bigger than your standard MR16, you know, just because of that heat issue we talked about. So this is a time for you to use your annotation tools uh, on the left-hand side of your screen. Can you pick out the guilty offenders here in this lineup and show us, uh, uh, use your annotation tools to show us which one are the companies maybe uh, cheating a little bit here on, their, on the size of their MR16s. <laughs> Somebody said all of them, good. Yeah, they're a little bit bigger. Now this could work. Um, it might be okay if the LED lamp sticks out a little bit from some of the fixtures, but they may not fit in others. But for those of us in the lighting world, usually the fixture's not meant to have that lamp sticking out. So you wanna make sure you have the right size. So one of the, the lessons learned here um, is to make sure that you are try out any of your lamps before you buy a large quantity. You know, looks like you found those suspects there. Don, are there are there other types of LED bulbs uh, that have the same sort of incompatibility or potential incompatibility issue? Yeah, that's a good question. There are some parking lot uh, fixtures that have a replacement lamp that would have this same uh, problem where, and I can think of also, I can think of two, the, the HID replacement LED lamp sometimes is larger than your existing fixture, so it might stick out. Uh, that would be one thing to look at. And then another one would be a, a pin-based compact fluorescent lamp that has an LED replacement. You wanna make sure size is the same when you do any type of replacements with that. So good question. 
So here's a list of the common, you know, base types. Most of your larger PAR lamps come with a standard Edison, you know, screw in screw base that you see here. Many of the smaller candle style lamps come with a smaller base. <clears throat> Adapter sockets are available if you need them and they will operate at 120 volts AC. Your MR16 lamp are typically low voltage and they usually have the little pins on the end of them. Some PAR16 and PAR20s have a push and turn GU10 type of base. Also operates at 120 volt AC and others of the, that type of fixture might have your standard Edison base. So you have to make sure that you know what kind of lamp you're replacing um, and get the correct LED replacement when you're doing this. So homework is super important and it's like what you're doing now. You're, you're checking out some of your options and make sure you check the qualified lamp replacement list with Energy Star as well. So in summary on lamps, the LED directional replacement lamps, the LED downlights, the LED A lamps are all great upgrade options right now to take a look at uh, for your applications. So let's shift to linear fluorescent LED. What we'll do here is we're going to do some comparison, uh, compare this LED, you know, with what we have typically seen in fluorescent uh, technology. So this is linear fluorescent LED comparisons. So it's, it's saying, you know, typically you would have a T8 fluorescent lamp and now they are making LED versions of that um, in a fixture mode or in a tube mode. So one of the things that you want to look at first is um, think about the fluorescent technology right now that we have in our facilities, the, the two by four troffer in your ceiling that has acrylic lens or parabolic, they're working well, they're energy efficient, you know, most of us have replaced those with energy efficient T8 lamps, high performing T8 lamps. Uh, so how do we, where do we go from there? Well, cost is one thing to look at. And LED is actually getting down to a point where sometimes it's making a lot of sense for customers. The lamp life is another thing to look at. Um, lamp failure on a fluorescent versus the useful, you know, light output is an important application or important thought to look at for your replacements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, lumens per watt, what you're getting out of the fixture that we saw on our efficacy versus efficiency is another thing to look at because fluorescent may have pretty good lumens per watt, but when it's stuck in a fixture, what does it do? So remember that when it comes to LED, when you're comparing lumens, to, lumens per watt. Fluorescent is proven, so let's face it, we've been, it's been around a long time, we feel comfortable with it. But still, looking at LED as an option now, we have turned that corner to where it's very promising uh, for, our, for now and in our very near future. It is still fairly new, so you want to make sure you're checking uh, things or maybe doing some comparisons. LED also is very controllable, dimming on, off. Uh, we did not have that with fluorescent before, so that's another great, uh, great thing for this application. LEDs have become more, much more energy efficient over time as well. On the DLC list, I noticed several, uh, you know, over 100 lumens per watt. So some of the applications where linear fluorescent is, is used, uh, recess troughers, as we've mentioned already, most common linear fluorescent fixtures, uh, you'll see this type of a fixture. It's just a bare, you know, lens troffer is what we call it in the lighting industry. I had you in a classroom here, I'd ask you to raise your hand. How many of you have these above your head? So notice how the light appears on the upper walls here in this picture. That's kind of what your two by four uh, direct lens type of fixture is doing. It's almost 180 degree distribution and that's a good thing for lighting up the walls in a space. Sometimes it gets a little glary depending on your application. And let's face it, this prismatic lens here, it's not, you know, overly decorative or anything. It's just kind of plain. There are LED dot options for this fixture. So if you still like it and still need it and you want that look, you can actually buy an LED fixture, maybe a little bit more cost, um, but, you know, the life of it's a lot, lasts a lot longer. And it looks just like this. I have shown people a fluorescent and an LED side by side and it's very difficult to tell the difference. 
So that might be an option for you if you're needing this lens fixture. The parabolic recess troffer, which is designated uh, to eliminate the glare uh, on your computer screens, and we've had this around since the late 80s, mid 80s, something like that. It's considered to be a little bit more modern or it was at that time. The, it, the glare on your computer screens is now gone because we have flat screen displays. So we've had issues with dark walls up above because it kind of gives you that little cave effect. So what we've done with as far as LED is concerned, typically you're going to see people replace this fixture, this parabolic fixture with a, a new high performing lens. It's not always recommended to stick some of the LED tube lights in this parabolic fixture because you're going to see, uh, you know, the, the LEDs and that's not always a great look. So that's just something to think about when you're replacing. I'll show you some, some options. I'm not saying people can't do it, but there are some other options to take a look at. So it's tempting to retrofit it with the T8 lamps, but I think it might make this cave effect even worse. So let's, let's examine those T8s here. This is what a lot of them look like. Not all of them show the LEDs like that. Some of them have a, a lens covering over them, so you sometimes can't even tell it's a, a T8 or an LED T8 tube. But the light output has in, increased quite a bit over time. There's over 4,000 replacement lamps on the qualified product list, on the DLC qualified product list, and 1,000 of them just last week, when I checked, uh, exceeded 3,100 lumens. The reason that's important is because you have to look at light output when you're comparing, and that is equal to a high-performing T8 lamp. So if our LED lumen output has already exceeded or met that high-performance T8, that shows you where we're at. The other thing to take a, look, a close look at when you're replacing with LED T8 tubes is the distribution. So this gives you an example of a 360 degree fluorescent tube in your fixture. So it's shooting some light off of the back possibly, depending on what's in your fixture. Now you replace it with an LED T8 lamp here or here, what happens? Um, you're going to get a whole different look in that fixture that it wasn't necessarily made for. So that's something to keep in mind when you're replacing. The cost of the lamp, uh, T8 fluorescent, you're five bucks or less compared to the LED T8s range anywhere from 15 to $35, depending on what you're purchasing, who you're purchasing it from, you know, how much light output you're getting, that sort of thing, but that just gives you a range and comparison. There are some, you know, uh, companies that are using these LED T8s and, and have been happy because it was a simple retrofit and they didn't have to worry about, you know, their fixture. Maybe they had a bare open strip fixture that it worked in. So just something to think about. There are three different types of T8 tube scenarios that I want to make sure you understand today. Um, one of them is, is basically you plug in that T8 tube and it uses the existing fluorescent ballast. That's something newer here in the last year or so. Uh, that they, they were able to make it use the existing fluorescent ballast. Now, think through that and make sure that it works for your application because if your ballast is pretty old, or especially if it's not an electronic T8 ballast, it's not going to work um, for that scenario because your ballast may, may not last much longer. So if you have a newer electronic T8 ballast and it's compatible with your T8 tube, that could be workable. There are also scenarios where they bypass, that, bypass the existing fluorescent ballast and they just wire directly to the socket. You know, you have to think about things like UL um, uh, approval on, on these retrofits, so keep that in mind and ask the manufacturers if they are UL approved. Uh, there's also a scenario where they have a brand new LED driver, which is, replaces your fluorescent ballast, and then you basically are doing a lamp and ballast replacement so to speak, but you're doing it with a driver and an LED tube. So three different scenarios for you that you'll see out there in the market. And there are incentives available now from Energy Trust of Oregon on this technology. You just have to kind of check out the prescriptive list to see which one works for your application. So another option for your troffers would be to retrofit with what we're referring to as an LED light bar here. So if you look at this fixture, 
this is not a tube or anything, it's just an actual strip of LEDs that gets installed in the trough or fixture. <clears throat> so you remove the existing fluorescent lamps, the, the lamp holders that would be on the end, and the ballast, and you install these light bars and an LED driver. It's similar to the fluorescent lamp and ballast scenario that we just talked about. You'd keep the existing lens in the fixture, unless of course it's old and yellow, you might want to replace it. The LED trough upgrade, this option for an LED trough upgrade would um, run you anywhere from 50 to 60 bucks, depending on you know who the manufacturer is and, and what you're doing and how much the labor cost is. May or may not provide this, this, this may or may not provide the best optics or appearance, because remember you're retrofitting a fixture that was made for you know your fluorescent technology, so always want to give it a try. Here's another sample of uh, that. Uh, you could refer to it as a light bar. This one is made by Cree, and others make it as well. Basically, this is not a tube. It, it doesn't go into sockets. It just you know wires to the driver, just like a lamp and a, a ballast would. But this is more like a fixture inside a fixture because it already has a lens on it. So there's another great application. Um, typically, if it's, this went into a troffer, you'd have a, a lens over it as well. So you want to think about your light output in the fixture. So if you're going to retrofit some of those acrylic lens troffers in your ceiling or the parabolic troffers in your ceiling, here's another recommendation that might be very workable for your area. It's a LED troffer retrofit kit with a brand new lens. This one is made by Lithonia, and others make a similar uh, look as well. So it comes with this kit that replaces, that, that fits right into the existing housing. So it's got the LED strips already in there. You mount it, you know, to the uh, to the inside of the fixture, and then you put a brand new high-performing lens on it. So it's a great option. The cost ranges in these type of kits are anywhere from 90 to 160 bucks, uh, you know, give or take a few depending on the manufacturer. The installation can be pretty easy. So you've got uh, a lot of light output per wattage of the fixture, and that could be 100 lumens per watt or higher uh, because of that delivered lumens, uh, the, it, the fixture efficiency versus delivered lumens. So you could increase light levels or at least maintain with a better distribution pattern using this lens. So pretty cool. <clears throat> you may also need to install a brand new LED troffer. There are many options out there. There's a couple here that you see with a mid-power LED light engine. Uh, Fine Light makes one that looks like the lens looks like that. And then this is one from Cree. They use, uh, this is their CR series. It mount, they mount indirect reflecting LEDs on top. <clears throat> excuse me, of a decorative room side heat, heat sink strip. And Cree, as well as other companies, have other illumination approaches as well. These are just some examples. Other companies like GE and Cooper use an edgelet uh, sort of approach. These fixtures are commonly available in one by four, two by four, and your two foot, we're talking foot here, in two by two sort of fixtures. So a recessed indirect fixture, this basket style is often used in lobbies and conference rooms and high-end office spaces. This is another thing you might want to take a look at. Uh, in a fluorescent version, you're not getting, it's not highly efficient because we weren't able to get a lot of the light out of a basket fixture. But now that we've moved to LED, they use that more high efficient lens and it, the fixture efficiency has, uh, is, is a much higher. And, um, and there are some things, sometimes this is more expensive because it's considered very decorative, so that might be a con. And the way the fixture is made with that basket sometimes uh, it makes it difficult to maintain. But if you need a basket style fixture like this with that kind of a lens and a little bit indirect light, definitely check with your manufacturer because they have come far in the LED versions of this. Here's another version that looks just like it, the VT version from Lithonia. And lastly, here's one from Cree. They call this their ZR series, which is like less than 100 bucks sometimes for the basic model if you buy a large quantity just for the you know, fixture cost, um, give or take a few. So you just need to get some pricing and, and see where you can go with some of these options.
If you want to have some real fun with LED, they call this color temperature changing LEDs, and they are now available. So basically, you, you can change the range of your color in an LED trough or fixture from, say, for example, 3,000 Kelvin temperature, which is your warmer, all the way up to 6,500. You can find these in troughers or desk lamps like you see here. And this helps with people's moods and things like that. So if they, they, you know, if it's a certain time of day, they want warmer color. If they need to be really alert, they might want it to go really high Kelvin temperature. Uh, you can check out the humancentriclighting.com for more information about mood, health, and visual acuity benefits uh, to us humans, which is very helpful sometimes to think about. Uh, you also have, um, what they call warm dim. This is a new technology you'll see in lamps. Uh, here are a couple of examples, traditional LED dimming and warm dim. So basically as it dims, it goes to a different color temperature, which is kind of cool. So it's shifting. And so you can check that out. This is an example from Juno, and I think there are also, Sylvania has a version and Philips has a version as well. So check that out. <clears throat> If you have some indirect lighting in your facility where like this fixture is highlighting, there's a little bit of maybe 10 or 20% coming out of the bottom, but most of it is directing up toward the top and hitting the ceiling and lighting down. So that's where you're getting light on your you know, desk or whatever. They have this now available in LED as well. So this fixture would have a run of LEDs on it, hitting the ceiling and bouncing off just like the fluorescent would. So you will be able to find those, the cost Maybe a little bit higher, but think about the flexibility of that. You could take an existing fixture and retrofit it, or you could buy a new one and you could do like, I don't know, two inches to 100 feet, you know, <laughs> whatever you want. Lots of flexibility when it comes to LED. This is what I would refer to as our vanilla fixture. So if you have some fluorescent wrap fixtures in your facility that look like this, You've got the normal prismatic lens wraparound fixture. We call it that. If I could hear any of you today, I'd say, why do you think we call it that? It's, it's because the lens wraps around. Now you are all lighting experts because you know that. But guess what? They make this in LED as well. And when this first came out, I saw the fixture and thought to myself, are you crazy? That looks just like a fluorescent. And I couldn't imagine why they were making it, but that's kind of where we're at with LED. The, the, the answer is basically, why not? You have a wraparound fixture that's needed in you know, hallways or storage rooms or things like that. Why not make it an LED? It's, become, it's down to the point now where it's gonna be cheaper soon to make it as an LED version. So underneath that fixture, you got your strips of LED, however long they need to be, and it has an LED driver. Uh, cost is very compatible. Um, the, let's just say the LED fixture cost is around 135 to 155 versus fluorescent, which would be around maybe 60 to $65. So you gotta think, think about things like you know, the life of it. Um, you also have a decorative version of a wrap fixture. This one's also by Lithonia, a little bit more decorative available, and that one's gonna cost more. So that'd be more in the 200 plus range, but if you needed something decorative, there are options out there in LED. So for those of you that have warehouses, you might have some of this high bay fixture in your warehouse. And we are now seeing replacements all over the place with LED options. So your HID fixture might be in a warehouse or a gym or a manufacturing facility, takes that kind of an HID lamp anywhere from 250 to 400 watt, and you can now see a replacement fixture that, that looks just like this. This is an occupancy sensor on the end. You're gonna have the same uh, really great distribution patterns like you see here in the gymnasium. Uh, color temperature options are available and light output is equal or better than the HID replacement. Think about things like life of the lamp, or how long that LED fixture is gonna last, um, how long that full light output will stay is gonna be a lot higher than the HID, which after halfway through its potential life, it, it loses about half of its light output. So this is a great option for LED, uh, going from either a low bay or a high bay fixture. Now, there are all kinds of versions available, if we had more time, I'd let you circle which one you think is prettiest, but let me just tell you that they're crazy looking and totally different, but they're awesome. They do the, they do the job really well. 
And I would imagine when HID, you know, globe type of fixtures or high bay type of fixtures first came out, it was a little crazy for us to look at the linear fluorescent kind and the HID kind. But now we get to see all kinds of shapes and sizes for LED high bays and how they can get that light output out of there, uh, what it might look like in an industrial facility. It's, it's really great. Uh, here's another option. A company called Digital Lumens and several others are making integral lighting controls because LED loves to dim and turn off and on and has no problem with it. They ship them right out of the box. All their fixtures come, you know, controllable. So that's a great option for LED that we didn't have before with some of the others. This last one that you're looking at as a high bay is actually an LED high bay. And as you can see, it looks very much like a fluorescent. And that's actually good in a lot of respects because it will be difficult for some, you know, customers to change to one of those, you know, funky different shapes and sizes. So there are also available fixtures that look just like fluorescent. Better light output, lasts longer. It's a done deal for some. So great opportunities, great options out there. Do you continue to do your research on it. So as we move outside, what about LED in the outdoors? Well, um, as you probably know, LED actually loves cool temperatures, doesn't mind at all. So you'll see LED applications all over the place um, in your street lighting, for example. PGE has been switching over from their high pressure sodium to an LED. It's already happened in my neighborhood. I stopped the guy and said, what are you doing? And my light fixture outside my home <laughs> and took some pictures of him and timed him while he changed it out. And it has you know, changed the, our whole neighborhood. Uh, so you'll see those all over the place because they have been able to save a lot of energy and uh, for you know, there's all of the street lights all over. But you can see it in the parking lot. This is a before and after to how well the LED distribution works outdoors. So think of it this way, you've, you've now moved into um, the low hanging fruit because there are, there's so much HID left out there in the parking lot, we, never, we didn't have anything before to replace HID with. And you'd have to either go group free lamp to get your full light output or replace it with a whole brand new fixture or, you know, maybe go linear fluorescent in some areas. Um, that was an okay option, but LED is one of the best options we've seen in a long time for energy efficiency. So your typical HID is 400 watts. So for example, when you switch to LED, um, your cost isn't a huge factor because you, if you would be replacing it with something like fluorescent or electronic HID or induction or anything like that, they're all going to have a high cost because it's on a pole and, you know, the labor's the same. So LED isn't a huge impact when it comes to cost of replacement. But the amount of energy you're going to save will, you know, balance it out plus maintenance. So the LED fixture uh, wattages range for your equal performance of the HID um, all over the place. But just for a rule of thumb, you might want to look at maybe a third of the existing wattage. So for example, if this, if this here, this lamp is 400 watt in your parking lot, you may go down to 150 watt. Sometimes less, sometimes more, depending on what you're doing, how, where, where you're trying to light the space and, you know, how long it's been there, all kinds of factors to look at. Maintenance alone is, a maintenance savings alone is a viable reason to upgrade in some cases. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. We also have controllable, um, you know, source now in the parking lot. So you can control these, dim them down, uh, shut them off and on every other fixture, tons of options available. Don't forget your parking garage where you have existing HID on 24-7. There are all kinds of replacements now. This top one you're looking at looks fluorescent. Uh, it looks like a fluorescent version, and you can now get this fluorescent version in an LED that looks just like that in LED. Saw some in the parking lot here in the building I'm in today. Uh, really was lighting the space well, and you can see your car color and everything. It's great. But there are all kinds of shapes and sizes. Again, a great maintenance factor here because these are hard to get to and hard to replace. Lots of control options as well for a parking garage. Don't forget about your wall mount exterior fixture. Typically would be an HID wall pack that you'd see like that. All kinds of versions of replacements. These are all listed um, on the Design Lights Consortium list. Several different manufacturers have options for you. And again, 
take a look at about the third of the wattage, um, if that gives you an idea. But remember, where is the light going, you know, in, in the space? Make sure you're highlighting the parking or the walkway is very important that it's not going straight down, but it's, you know, if you're highlighting a walkway or a sidewalk, that's what you need to look at when it comes to replacing your existing wall packs. So take a moment to use your annotation tools while we finish up here. And just uh, tell me what's most important for the application that you're looking at today. You know, we've said a lot about LED, and you're thinking, wow, she really likes LED. But <laughs> uh, you also might think, hmm, I guess I need to start looking at some options. And as you're voting there, let me just tell you, <clears throat> one of the main things to look at and to talk to your distributors and your contractors about is getting some sample installations. Always consider a mock-up demonstration when it comes to new technology like this so you can see what it looks like. We have a lot of customers that do that, so you might even be able to see what some of the other customers have done to see what it might look like in your space if you're not able to get a demo. So it looks like we have got a lot of different considerations for your applications out there. You, you know, material and labor costs is big. How long that lamp life is is great because it's going to take you, um, it's going to take you some money to get that changed when it comes to um, replacement or maintenance costs. Uh, that last one down there, aesthetics, is really important because how your space looks, especially if you're retail, but even if it's just employees, people want to feel good in a space. And I believe, of course, lighting makes a difference. Thank you uh, very much for your feedback here. This gives us a really good indicator. Lastly, I just want to make sure you know that Energy Trust offers LED incentives all over the place. We have a form called the 190L uh, Prescriptive Incentive Form. It's, the L stands for lighting, so make sure you look that up. It'll give you all of these available LED incentives. The down light is like 30 bucks, so that's great. Case lighting and directional lamps, interior trough or fixtures and kits, LED outdoor and sign lighting uh, prescriptive incentives are available. We also have what we call custom incentives for any, one, any of those fixtures that are not on the standard list. So you would be set for incentives, definitely. Make sure that you contact us. I'm going to pass it over to Beth right now, who's going to tell you how you can get a free consultation. Thanks, Don. Um, as Don mentioned, of course, um, PGE and Energy Trust do provide free energy efficiency consultations to assist you in identifying the sa saving opportunities at your site. And if you're interested in um, a over-the-phone or in-person consultation in your commercial business, you can contact Paula Conway. Or if you're an industrial customer, please contact Stacy Milliman, and their contact information is up here on the screen, and I'll leave it open for a while. And before we proceed to question and answers, I'd like to remind you, you can continue to submit questions to me, and I will ask them of Dawn. And our first question was more of a comment, and I'm going to unmute one of our participants to share their experience with TLEDs. Rachel, can you hear me? Hello, Rachel. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we oh. can. Okay, good. I was muted in two places. Um, uh, we installed some LED T8 style fixtures in our freight elevator, and they have been working great. The light quality and coverage is wonderful, and the fact that they're solid state makes them a little sturdier than some other freight elevator fixtures that have left glass behind. So we're very happy with the change in that elevator. Excellent. That's great to hear. Thank you, Rachel. And uh, our next question was, uh, do, um, will LEDs work as plant growing lamps? Well, that's a whole nother seminar, but <laughs> great question. Uh, and there, there are some seminars available for that. Any type of grow lights, that's what the question was, right, Beth, about grow lighting? Yes. Uh, people are looking at LED options now. There are many manufacturers making specific fixtures for that, and then some that you could just use specifically to replace uh, the current HID sources where they use a warmer and a cooler light. 
So uh, we can, I can give you some recommendations. Uh, if, if Beth has your email, I can give you some recommendations of where to look for that or some manufacturers to talk to, uh, or even some of your distributors might know. So that is a source that they're looking at. It's just big because you're growing something. So it's a little different than your everyday technology. So good question. Thank you, Don. That, yeah, that is a complicated one. Um, next question is, I've heard that LEDs don't work well with the existing dimmers. And why is that? Yeah, that's another good question. Especially in your residential, you want to look at the dimming package that you have or the dimmer that you have because there are some comp compatibility issues. So if you buy a new LED source and you're expecting to dim it, first thing you want to do is look on your lamp, for example, if it's going to be an LED lamp in your home or in a commercial building it'll tell you whether it's dimmable. So that's the first thing you wanna look at. And then if it is dimmable, it should give you a list of compatible dimmers. So because we're talking electronics here, there has to be some compatibility. Like for example, when I got my new phone, my headset didn't work in my new iPhone 6 because there was a compatibility issue. So it's the same sort of challenge. Um, just make sure you check the list to see if it's a compatible dimmer. You may just have to buy a new one. Thank you, Don. And we have time for one more question. We're over a little bit, but um, looks like most of you are still with us. So we'll, we'll, this will be our last question. Um, I'd like to try out a directional LED lamp. What is the best way to get a sample lamp to try and which ones would you recommend? Yeah, that's another great question. I recommend that you work with a distributor, a lighting distributor. Since we're talking more of a commercial and industrial market, I'd work with your electrical distributor or lighting distributor that works with the Energy Trust of Oregon so they can make sure that it's on the qualified products list. And then I would just go and ask for maybe a few different samples to try them. Um, so, you know, your places like Platt and Oaf and uh, Crescent and North, you know, North Coast and Portland Lighting and Pacific Lamp, all those places that are a part of the network, talk with one of those people if you already have an existing relationship even better and they can give you some different manufacturer samples to try. Thank you, Don, and that was our last question. I'd like to thank you all for joining us today.